safely into the new year. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sin. Please help us to always be obedient to you. Please bless the Michael X Y program, and may the Holy Spirit help us children to understand the story. Thank you for the teachers, and thank you for all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, everybody. I see you still reading that book you were telling me about. I am, and I'm sitting a bit sad. Why? Did somebody else get Martha? Well, no, not quite. So why are they sad then? Because, Ellie, this book speaks about our history, our present, and our future. Huh? How was that possible? Well, in here, I have read about the faithful Christians who stood up for their lives, no matter how their lives were threatened, and God's unchangeable law. That is very much a part of our present lives. Also, I read in here about God's grace covering all. Don't you wonder about that sometimes? Um, sometimes, but I don't see why that would make you sad. Well, that's not the sad part. The sad part is when I read about future events. I can see that boys and girls are not ready. There are so many boys and girls who have questions like Michael, but they don't have mommies like Michael to tell them the truth. Oh, I see what you mean. My friend Kay was telling me that she didn't understand angels. Hmm, and that is interesting, because Michael asked his mom about angels, and she said to read Hebrews 1.14. I learned that angels are spirits that will send to help boys and girls receive salvation. Really? I wish I had known that. I could have explained it to her. She also wanted to know what will happen to her when she dies. Hmm, well that's exactly what I'm reading about right now. The death and the resurrection. Many of our friends are afraid to die. But maybe if they were comforted in the promise of resurrection, they wouldn't be so scared to die. I guess you may be right. You really have learned a lot from reading that book. I have, and my brother says he prefers to look at the series instead. But I always read the book to get direct information. You're just a bookworm. A nice juicy one, in fact. You know, nobody really likes eating books. So that makes me smarter and stronger. Nice perspective. Maybe I pick a copy of that book up after all. Can't let you have all the smarts now, can I? Well, with God, there's lots of smarts to share. Come, do this activity with me. Welcome back everyone. I am so happy to see you here again for the second half of the Michael Anthony Reading Adventure. I am Damari. And I am Auntie Maria, welcoming you to this second half. I want to start by saying a big thank you to God who has brought us this far into the second half. And I want to thank our family in Trinidad who just gave us our dramatization. It gave us a glimpse of some of the things we can look forward to in this half of Michael Axe Way. We also want to thank all you boys and girls who helped us with special music, prayer, chat reviews, dramatization, and all the other things you sent us to make our program a little better. 
We are so thankful. And your gifts are a blessing to us and others. In this half of the program, we hope to have some uncles joining us. But for now, let me thank you aunties who have assisted us so far by getting persons to do different things on the program and for teaching us things in features each week. Speaking of aunties, let's welcome one of our aunties and see what we can learn from this week's feature. Hi everyone, my name is Auntie Alertha and today I want to tell you a little about how my plants talk to me. Oh, it's not an audible voice. I have to look for clues and signs when I see changes in my plants. Look for signs? Yes, signs are all around us. There are road signs that help us to use the road safely. There are signs that give us directions like to turn right or to turn left or to find the washroom. There are signs all around us, even in my garden. A few years ago, my friend encouraged me to start a garden. She even brought me some plants to start with. Soon, my little garden was on its way. But then I discovered that my plants were dying and I didn't know why. As time went by, I learned how to look for clues to keep my plants healthy. So take a walk with me as we look for signs of anything that might be affecting my plants. Let's start with my tomatoes. They look healthy, don't they? But look here, something is wrong. There are no leaves on this part of the plant. But when I looked closer, I saw that it was being eaten by the tomato hornworm. I quickly got rid of it because I know it will eat my entire plant if I left it there. Now, let's look at this pepper plant. Look closely under this leaf. Do you see the tiny white mealybugs? They suck on leaves and cause them to turn yellow, wilt, and drop off. And we know that plants need their leaves to make food. Oh no! Look at my peace lily plant. It's all eaten down. What do you think did this? Let's look for clues. I see a slimy line on my plants and on the ground around it. Ha! It is either slugs or snails or maybe both that made a meal from my plant. You know, Jesus promised us that he will return to this earth to take us to live with him. He gave us some signs to look for that will show us that his coming is near. In Matthew chapter 24, we can read of several signs that Jesus gave us. Remember in chapter 17 of our book, Michael Acts Why, we learned of the dark day and in chapter 18, we talked about the falling of the stars. But there are other signs for us to look for. In verse 7, of Matthew chapter 24, it tells us that there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. Do you know that last year, swarms of locusts destroyed thousands of acres of farmland in parts of Africa? And there is still a threat of them returning? And what about new diseases that are affecting us, like the COVID-19 coronavirus? We now have to wear our masks, wash our hands thoroughly, use hand sanitizers, and social distance to stay safe. These are all signs that indicate that Jesus is coming soon. Just like the signs help me to take care of my plants, when we look for the signs Jesus gave us, it will help us to live our lives just like Jesus wants us to. So that when he comes, we will be ready to live with him. Thank you, Auntie Eleven, for reminding us that the signs of Jesus coming have started hundreds of years ago and is continuing even today. God is so good that he keeps his signs 
from age to age, from generation to generation. He also wants everyone to know that he will come again as he promised. Okay, so before we get to this week's chapter, let's do a bit of a review of the things we talked about recently on Michael Atsway. We were learning about William Miller's prediction and about the 2300 day prophecy that he studied. He realized that Jesus was coming soon and he gave up farming and spent much of his time spreading the word that the second advent of Christ was soon. This week, we will learn that many other farmers left their crops in the field and used most of their time getting ready for Jesus to come. They also used much more of their money to trumpet the message. The hour of God's judgment is come. In episode 19, we talked about the Jewish holy day called the Day of Atonement, which was held on the 10th day of the 7th month. Today, let's talk a little about another holy day which was held 10 days before the Day of Atonement. It was called the Feast of Trumpets and it was to announce that the Day of Atonement was drawing near. Actually, the first day of every month was a holy day for the Israelites. On the Feast of Trumpets, they were required to bring the usual monthly offering, plus they needed to bring an extra offering. So, on the first day of the seventh month, two silver trumpets were blown to announce this holy day, and the congregation of Israel gathered at the sanctuary with their sacrifices and special gifts. This was not a day of mourning. God commanded that the congregation celebrate this day with joy and gladness. Remember that this holy day was a symbol of something that was real. So let's make a checklist and see if we can find out what the Feast of Trumpets actually represented. What real event can you think of that one involved persons joyfully trumpeting the word that the Day of Atonement was coming? Two, involved persons stopping their work and focusing on the judgment to come. And three, involved persons bringing extra amounts of offerings for God's work. This real event is the first angel's message of Revelation 14, 6 and 7. This is a message that Miller and others spread across the world that Jesus was coming soon to judge everyone. There you have it. The Bible is filled with signs, symbols, and prophecies, and it is exciting to search the scriptures and discover these treasures. Yes, it is. Now it's time for this week's story. We are happy to welcome Jeanette Barry and her son Niall. They live in Dominica and attend the Salisbury SDA Church. Niall is seven years old and enjoys playing, drawing, building things and doing art and craft. Now if you watch Auntie Kay's Children's Sabbath School, you'll see Niall presenting a nature nugget each week. Niall shares this Bible verse from Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. After this item of special music by the gems, we will hear chapter 22, Looking for Our Answers. Music from the world above, it made my soul rejoice. 
His soothing words and melodies let the rippling waters flow. But a million grits of stripless stone is the sweetest song I know. A million grits of stripless stone, so how sweet is the song? Sweeter song, sweeter song in this life could be found. Heard about the sabers that washed us white, white as snow. But a million grits of stripless stone. Is the sweetest song I know. Amazing grits of stripless sounds. Oh, how sweet, sweet is the sound. Sweetest song, sweetest song in this life. Could be found. Heard about the sacred blood. Washed us white, white as snow. But amazing grits of stripless sounds. It's a sweetest song I know. Amazing grace of stripless songs, it's the sweetest song I know. But amazing grace of stripless songs, it's the sweetest song I know. But amazing grace of stripless songs, it's the sweetest song I know. But amazing grace of stripless songs, it's the sweetest song I know. Chapter 22. Looking for Answers Michael, let's look up the story of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. Oh, I know that story. They were all waiting for a wedding of little oil lamps, but they had to wait too long for the groom to come, and all ten virgins fell asleep. When they woke up, he was coming, but five of them didn't have any oil left for their lamps. They had to run to town quickly to buy some more. The other five had brought extra oil. They were able to go into the wedding with him. Very good, Michael. This story describes the early Adventists, the followers of William Miller, who were looking forward to Jesus' coming. They knew that Jesus was coming. All of the signs Jesus had talked about had taken place. The destruction of Jerusalem, the persecution of the church during the Dark Ages, the sun being darkened, the moon not giving light, and the stars falling from heaven. All of the people who believed in the Advent message were excited about Jesus' coming, just like all ten virgins were excited about the bridegroom's coming. The oil in that story represented the Holy Spirit. Some bridesmaids didn't have extra oil with them. They had joined the wedding party on impulse, not prepared for trials or delay. When the time came for the groom to come, their lamps were out of oil. The disappointment in 1844 was bitter, and many of the believers couldn't handle the delay and the embarrassment when Jesus didn't come. Some had joined the Millerites out of fear, or they had depended on the faith of others rather than studying God's word for themselves. So they did not have the Holy Spirit to help them through the trials. During this time, there were many fanatics who went way beyond the bounds of common sense. These fanatics gave the rest of the Adventist group a bad reputation. And most of the Adventist believers had no sympathy with these people. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He always watches carefully for errors and defects among God's people, then points them out so everybody notices while many good things they do go entirely unmentioned. In times of renewed faith, Satan brings in people who have ungodly hearts and unbalanced minds. They become the fanatics of the group. Fanatical Christians were a problem even in Luther's day. They're a problem now too. Yes, they are. It's one of Satan's way of interfering with God's message. But we shouldn't give up on God's church just because it includes some fanatics. All the Millerites were expecting Jesus to come in the autumn of 1844. Some farmers who were expecting his coming left their crops in the fields and the potatoes still in the ground. They spent time searching their hearts for any sins they could should confess while waiting for Jesus to come. Of course, he didn't come, and the Millerites were bitterly disappointed. Many people gave up their faith. Ellen White tells us 
that their disappointment at that time was terrible, but it was not as great as the disappointment experienced by the disciples when Jesus died. That must have been even worse. After 1844, people expected Adventism to disappear. After all, these people had been expecting Jesus to come, and he hadn't. However, God's people who had been searching their hearts and humbly reading his word recognized that the Holy Spirit had really been working. There must be a different answer. There must have been a mistake. He remembered the story of Jonah. You mean because Jonah told the people of Nineveh that the city was going to be destroyed and it didn't turn out that way? Maybe there was something else that the 1844 people didn't understand. You're right. Looking back on the whole experience, William Miller said he would not have done anything differently. He had felt at the time that God wanted him to preach that message and he did what God had told him. God didn't abandon his people in the terrible disappointment. Even though they couldn't understand what his plan was, they trusted him and stayed faithful to him. Our quiz is next. All the best! Question 1. The story of the ten virgins is found in the book of Mark. Is this A true or B false? lamps represented the Holy Spirit. Is this A true or B false? compared to foolish virgins. B. Were embarrassed when Jesus didn't come. C. Ran out of the Holy Spirit. Or D. All of the above. as the blank of the brethren. A. Disruptor of the brethren. B. Annoyer of the brethren. C. Accuser of the brethren. Or D. Of the brethren. The answer C. Accuser of the brethren. Persons with unbalanced minds 
of the brethren. The answer is A, but Fanatics. Question 9. Fanatics were a problem during the time of William Miller and A. John Huss. B. John Wycliffe. C. Martin Luther. Or D. The Walt Dancy. Congratulations. We'll see you next week for Chapter 23, Cleaning God's Temple in Heaven. God bless you.